the drive way back. It might be, it could be, it is. Holy cow, welcome to another broadcast of Bricks Behind the Ivy. Here's your host, Jeff and Sean. <laughs> Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Bricks Behind the Ivy. I am your host, Jeff, a.k.a. Candid Cubs Rickowskis. And I will tell you one thing is certain. This podcast will have more hosts than the Cubs had runs today. Um, If you did not catch the matinee here on Thursday, May 23rd, the Cubs lost (laughs) to nothing to the Braves as the offense continued to struggle. And I feel like it is a broken record of late as the offense has not looked very good. Thanks for joining me on yet another episode of Bricks Behind the Ivy, the podcast for Cub fans by Cub fans. And yeah, I think it's been a tougher stretch of Cubs baseball this week. We were hoping a homestand could get them going as they split another road trip as they played the Pirates and the Braves. And guess what? They came home to play the Pirates and the Braves. And in a lot of cases, it was a lot of the same pitching matchups as the last trip. So it felt a little bit like deja vu all over again, or the classic Bill Murray movie Groundhog's Day, in which we were just doing the same thing, but this time with less runs and less victories, which is unfortunate, which is a magical transition to this week's box score blitz. If you're not familiar with the segment, I try to go through the Cubs box scores as quickly as possible to catch you up on what you've missed in Cubs baseball, potentially in the last week since our last episode. So let's put some time on the fake clock. Three, two, one, Go. Game one of a four game set versus the Pittsburgh Pirates as they come to the friendly confines. The Cubs get to see, guess what? Jared Jones again versus the Man of Steel, Justin Steele. Guess what? His kryptonite is still the long ball. Gave up some bombs in this game. First inning bomb to Edward Olivares. Fifth of the year, the Cubs are down 2 0 early. But Hap Daddy still confused why Bukshiabi refers to this man as Hap Daddy. No one's ever called him Hap Daddy that I'm aware of. He's Happer or the Hat Man or Ian or Ian Hat makes me coffee, but not Hap Daddy. Anywho, Ian Hap after a few days off for a break comes home and hits a home run off Jared Jones in that high velocity so good to see especially since the ball was hit over 100 miles per hour got out in a hurry but Nick Gonzalez answered immediately with his own home run in the fourth but Nick Madrigal answered right back with a single yes not a home run but to make the game 3-2 to two. but that was as close as the Cubs would get was within one they only had one hit with runners in scoring positions one for five in that game the Cubs end up losing five to four guess what it's time for game two already and the parrot on the pirate's shoulder is named paulie paulie schemes paulie schemes was absolutely brilliant in this game <laughs> he had six innings pitched 11 k's and was throwing a no hitter before they took him out only one walk and kyle Hendricks, who is the complete opposite type of pitcher that paul schemes is he was not good lots of hard contact lots of soft contact lots of contact in general gave up seven earned runs cubs lose a laugher nine to three not much more to talk about in this game so it's time for game three time for premium tv because guess what it's showtime showtime even naga starting this game versus bailey falter bailey falter looked like cy young out there versus off <laughs> the cubs did not muster much offense against him but guess what even naga was nasty as usual seven pitch four hits only one walk seven k's the season era is down to 0.84 she get one of those uh era bright watchers just like the shano meter from the 80s cup score on a walk-off hit from the best mile in baseball mr christopher morale there was a very close play at the plate pirate for upset play was reviewed Cubs score Cubs win still only five hits in this game uh, the bullpen looked really good they had 12 strikeouts as a staff with Shota Imanaga so it's another five for the bullpen good work by Mr. Ed, well, uh, Mike Mark Leiter Jr. aka Lights Out and Hector Neris game four Cubs working for a split in this series Mitch Keller versus Jameson Tyone Jameson got to see his former club this time he had a little bit of a back issue going into the last series so he did not get the catch Tyone did throw a lot of pitches in this game he threw 92 pitches and I only got him through 4.2 we had three and runs, two walks, four Ks, and boy, a lot of traffic. Wesnitsky came into this game with the bags full, gave up a two-run single to that pesky Nicky Gonzalez. 
steps try to come back in this one, but they just don't. 4.1 scoreless innings from that Cub bullpen, but still only two hits in this game. Cub blue. 3-2, to two, they lose the series 3-1, to one, so they only take one game out of four at home versus Pittsburgh. Not what you want to see, but guess what? Monday is an off day, hopefully a recharge day. Nico Horner didn't play much that weekend because he had a hamstring issue, but they said he would be back for the Tuesday game, so that was good news. Dansby Swanson was activated from the injured list, and they sent down Nick Madrigal. Nope, they didn't. That's what everybody on Twitter wanted, but they sent out Miles Master Pony back to Iowa. PCA adds two more A's to his last name, so he's now PC AAA, as he also goes to join the Iowa Cubs so he can get some regular bats. Immediately homers in his first game back at the Iowa Cubs just because he missed that. So Madrigal will survive another roster crunch for now. The Braves are back, and this seems very familiar. It's Charlie Morton versus Javier Assad, the ass man. Assad was a bit wild in this game, but the wind was howling out. There were five walks, but he did not give up a lot of damage. He still had two home runs, four Ks, and four point two to the pitch, but the bullpen came in and gave their gutsiest performance of the year with that one howling out of Wrigley Field. 5.1 shutout inning, 6 Ks, and only one hit. So that was awesome. No one told the Cubs it was rolling out because they did not hit any home runs. They did score 3 in the bottom of the 6 to tie this game up. Zach Short giveth, Zach, Zach Short taketh away. Zach Short giveth in this game. He had a feeling error that allowed Bush to reach. He scored on a Mike Talkman single. In the 10th inning, the Cubs walk off with a Nico Chopper. Friend of the pod, Patrick Erickson was at this game. So glad he got to fly the W and sing the damn song. Game 2, another Man of Steel start this week. This one was his best since he has come back from the injuries list. At 6.1 innings, the line does not look as good. He had five earned runs, five Ks, only five hits, and one walk. If he had gotten taken out after the sixth inning, we'd be having a completely different conversation about a start, because guess what? He left the game with some runners on base and got those earned runs because Jose Claus decided instead of being a pitcher, he wanted to be a pitching machine and just gave up absolute rockets. This game gets out of control very, very quick uh, because of Jose Claus, and the only thing left to talk about this game was Porter Hodge. He made his major league debut. He threw ten pitches, got three strikeouts, almost an immaculate inning, featured a fastball and a cutter with some high velocity, lots of swing with lots of whiffs, so looking forward to more Porter Hodge in the future. Game three today, day baseball at Wrigley Field. It was Mr. Brown versus AJ Smith-Shover, and what can Brown do for you? He can shove 10 whiffs and four innings pitch, six Ks, only one hit versus Braves lineup, so I'll absolutely take it. Hayden comes in to piggyback him as this was planned to be a bullpen day. He gives a tank to the former top prospect, Jared Kellenick. Kyle Hendricks made his debut out of the pen as he was removed from the rotation after that hit fest versus Pittsburgh, who had one of the worst batting averages of his right hand hitters, so it was justified. He still had two innings pitch, four hits, two runs, one one, one strikeout, still not looking that great out of the pen. Cubs lose this one three to nothing. Two runs late by Kyle Hendricks made this one feel really far away. Not many hits for the Cubs, and that is your box score blitz. So we did see the Cubs win two games. In seven tries at home. So two and five home stand. Not what you want to see. Cubs will be moving on in our series preview versus the Milwaukee Brewers and the St. Louis Cardinals, who the Brewers are in first and the Cardinals are in third. A sweep of the Cubs this weekend by the Cardinals would actually put them back at 500, which would put them in the conversation of this division once again. And the Brewers, the Cubs are still two games back as they are still the first place squad. They have been scuffling is a strong word, but they have not been playing as hot as they've been earlier. Uh, they are only four and six in their last 10, where the Cubs are three and seven. So neither one of them is really playing to their best at this moment. The Cubs have just been super banged up and that has been the story. I think that is a good portion of the offensive conversation, but let's be honest, the overall numbers are ugly. So the Cubs are 9 and 12 this month, which is not great. And in April, they won 17 and 10 after a 1 and 2 March. Obviously, there was only a few games in March. So that's seven games over 500 in April is what you want to see. But they weren't really just destroying the ball. They were playing some tough opponents in there. They win when they were supposed to. They played some interesting games in Arizona. They played the Dodgers. But only a 239 team batting average and a 315 on base at that point. So it's not like they were tearing the cover off, but it did feel a lot better than it does right now. Cubs in May only hitting 207 as a team, 297 on base percentage, only 339 slug. So just not what you want to see. But the biggest issue for them has been health. There has been stretches in there in which their top players, especially the big parts of this lineup that they need to produce, 
have not been there. And that is going to hurt any team. And the Cubs this year have been challenged more than most in the health department. If you told me, you know, if you at the beginning of the season, the Cubs would lose Justin Steele, Jameson Tyone, and many others in the pitching staff. Jer- uh, Merriweather in the bullpen. Uh, Keegan Thompson now. Um, any of these other guys that have been key parts. Ed Brazley would be ineffective and also now potentially have an arm strain that is requiring a second opinion. They would lose Cody Bellinger for a stretch. Dansby Swanson would have a knee issue. Nico Horner would have a hamstring issue. Ian Happ, he started the season with a little bit of an issue and I'm not sure how healthy he has been at times, but he has not looked right at the plate, which have had a lot of Cub fans calling for him to be removed from the lineup. There's just been a few guys in this stretch that have been asked to carry a heavier offensive load, which I think generally can... you can see guys begin to press as other guys have been taken out of the lineup because they realize that the role is more important. So I think someone like Ian Happ who had to be slid in the three hole during some parts of the stretch. I just don't know if he thrives very well there. Didn't have much protection. Christopher Morrell has continued to have a very interesting season. There has been some articles by like Sahad of Sar- Sharma and Patrick Booney and a few other Cubs pundits discussing, you know, his batting average on balls in play, his launch angle, and how hard he's hitting the ball. A lot of the advanced analytics or some of the, you know, some of the digging stats that you can go into is showing that he's hitting the ball very hard. He's hitting it at a pretty solid launch angle as sometimes he's hitting it too high, but his patience, the walk rate is up, the strikeout rate is down, the chase rate is down. All these things should turn into a player that is extremely productive for this lineup. Right now, while they're in their cold stretch, it's not. And there was a discussion on Cubs Twitter today that hitting the ball hard is bad because there were some arguments about at some point results are results. And I think that on the surface, that is one way to look at it. But on the other side of that coin, results are complicated in baseball because we were talking about a game, as I get on my statistics soapbox, that is designed around 70% plus failure. And that margin, I feel like, is only increasing each year as the ball is people have learned to position, people have learned to pitch, the velocity of the pitches have gotten higher. There are just so many things going against a hitter, which, you know, people like Bo Jackson and other multi sport stars in our lifetime have said that hitting the baseball is one of the hardest things to do in all professional sports. And we've just continued to make it harder with spin and velocity for these guys. So, When you do think that a player should be producing, you do need to realize that there is a marathon of data and a lot of our reactions in modern sports, especially in how we look at these things, come in a sprint. So Bricks Behind the Ivy is a weekly podcast, a Cub podcast for Cub fans, by Cub fans, and we take a look at the sprint. But I think one thing that Sean and myself have been very good at on this podcast is also taking some time to respect the marathon. We have made jokes about small sample size alert, understanding that some stretches for players can mean something if there is information in there, like outside the zone swing percentage or looking at hard contact rate that can show a player changing some sort of approach for past performance that could indicate to something better going forward. Christopher Morrell is a great example of this because of his drop in outside the zone, which means he's not chasing pitches. His then increase in walk rate, which means his selection is getting better. He is walking a lot more. And some of his batting average on balls and plays numbers are showing a lot of unluckiness. He has had some hits in games recently, including one today, in which the expected batting average of the hit was 600 plus, which means that of a lot of the balls of the certain angle it was hit, the speed it was hit, would land for a hit, you know, nearly 60% of the time or 40% of the time, that would not be the result. And in baseball, a 60-40 is buzzard luck given that the best players to ever play the game are succeeding at a 30% rate. So Christopher Morrell specifically's batting average in balls in play this season is, or this month, uh, if we're looking from the 1st to the 23rd, is at 170. 
that's just not sustainable. <laughs> There's not a lot of guys in baseball history, especially with the walk rate and how hard he hits the ball and how much better he's been doing on pitch selection that are going to see a 170 bat pip. And at some point, he's going to play games in a warm Wrigley field. And yes, he's going to hit a ball that's going to steal a home run. And we all know that baseball can absolutely, absolutely be a mental game. As a human being myself, I respect how much the brain has a power over what we do and the decisions that we can make and how my brain processes something and my confidence shifts how I attack situations in my day-to-day -day life. And in baseball, when you're attacking different things, there's reaction, there's all these different things, there's you know, like your hand-eye coordination, there's your brain processing the pitch, and we only have so much time to process and pick up spin and then to have our body react. There's all these challenges that come in. But on top of that, when you are attacking a game that has such a high failure rate, positivity is something that needs to be generated from the player. So that is an extremely challenging thing to do. So if I'm Christopher Morrell, I think it would be very frustrating for this Cubs coaching staff to tell him, hey, everything looks great, but just please, please don't look at the scoreboard when you come to bat because the numbers aren't translating to necessarily the guy that's on the field right now. And that, as a baseball player, is probably really hard to understand. As you look at some of the surface level numbers that fans are going to look at, you're going to feel very differently about how you're performing versus what is being said behind the scenes. So... I see Christopher Morrell as a guy that moving forward is not going to be an issue in this lineup. Guys I do see as an issue in this lineup and looking at how the guys have been performing this month are also probably players that aren't going to be part of the Chicago Cubs lineup moving forward in 2024, or at least they are part of this lineup or part of this team and have very, very different roles that they are being asked to do something completely different at this time because of injuries. So examples of that would be Nick Madrigal and Miles Masturboni, who have been the punching bags of the commentary around the Cubs and their lack of scoring. These aren't guys that you're super excited about giving regular at-bats to in a normal situation. However, Nick Mandrigal's glove in the past, especially last year, has been, you know, grading above average to better at third base as Christopher Morrell has been learning the position. We can argue about whether or not Christopher Morrell should have been playing that position much sooner than he ended up being to kind of smooth out these bumps. That's a fair criticism. But having Nick Mandrigal on this roster as a backup for Christopher Morrell and some of those tighter games in the early, early in the year has been very important. The Cubs have played a ton of one-run games. So having defense as a priority, as a bench piece, isn't a terrible option. And Nick Mandrigal, when he has been healthy, the idea has been he's a hitter that doesn't strike out much and puts the ball in play. Now, we can talk about quality of contact and a bunch of different things with Nick Madrigal and what type of player he is now versus what type of player people thought he was going to be versus the type of player he was in a small sample size in the 2020 season. That's a completely different conversation and probably a side topic for a completely different podcast. So, but I do sit on the team that is running out of patience for him getting regular at bats on this team when there are potential options, especially when the office offense is struggling as much as it does in Iowa. Miles Masterboni is another one that has been a punching bag for very similar reasons, but Looking at some of his numbers, he does grade out a little bit better than Nick Madrigal and things like base running. His defense at times looked pretty solid at shortstop while Dansby Swanson was off, while also looking pretty tough in some of his throws. But when you're used to watching Dansby Swanson, who does the little things every day better than most shortstops you're going to watch in a lifetime because of just how meticulous he is about his craft watching anyone else can be very challenging. And there has been times this year where the Cubs defense has looked pretty sloppy. And I am going to dig into that a little bit more, probably for a future episode. And I'm interested based on 
the range and some of the positioning at third and first base and how it's potentially affected Nico Horner and Dansby Swanson. And ultimately as well, you know, Cody Bellinger is a solid center fielder, but isn't bringing, you know, as much defensive value as he has in the past, but still a solid amount. These numbers also tend to normalize the more reps these guys get in, and we have a better idea of what their range factor is compared to others. And, you know, Say Suzuki has continued to improve, but of late, he has kind of looked a little lost out there. And that brings us to one last point I do want to make about the Cubs offense, and that is Say Suzuki. He has looked, since he has come back from the oblique injury, not the same side as last time. He started off with some at-bats where he was getting the hard contact and just not having much luck. And then there was kind of a shift where I felt like there was an at-bat this past weekend versus the Pirates where he seemed to be kind of like stretching his side a little bit more than usual. And he has just not looked very comfortable at the plate of late. Seems like premeditated swing decisions. He's not getting great contact. And the results are also not there. In May... Say Suzuki, yes, in a much smaller sample size because of the health, he's got a 38 runs created plus, which 100 being average, that is quite bad. The strikeout rate isn't alarming. It's only at 20%. The walk rate is down to 4.4% for this month, and he's only hitting 150. That's not great. That's actually a lower batting average than Nick Madrigal and Miles Mastroboni. And about the same sample size. Say Suzuki has 10 games in there, Miles has 11, and Nick Madrigal having the most there at 18. So the Cubs' best hitters, which this month have been Nico, he had heated up quite a bit at the beginning of this month, Cody Bellinger, who had seemed to be heating up, and when he came back from his injury, has seemed like he's been a good stretch, and then Christopher Morrell, he has been very solid in regards to walk and strikeout rate, about 14% on that walk side, which is very strong, and 19.5% on that strikeout side. He has been getting on base, and when he has been on the ball, it's been a fracture base hit, so that slugging is pretty high. So he's at 118 way to run create a plus in May. But besides that, Mike Talkman seen a step back because he is a great extra player, extra outfielder, as he, as he has been for the Cubs. His approach is great, but as you ask him to be more than that, as you ask some of these guys that are supposed to be depth for the Cubs to be more than that, you're going to start to see offenses fall apart. And Ian Happ is a very solid player on a very solid baseball team. He's not a three-hitter. He's not the star of this Cubs offense. So the Cubs need these guys to get healthy and they need the guys that they have paid to produce to start producing. And Dansby and Nico being back hopefully helps solidify this group the first few games back. I'm sure there's going to be some rest. Neither one of them took a rehab assignment. Nico actually never went on the IL. And Ian Happ seems to be coming out of his funk. He had a home run. He had a few stretch of some extra base hits. Uh, in the last few days, he has an extra base hit today. So hopefully he's coming out of his funk. So that'll help stabilize the lineup and not put so much on-base pressure onto someone like Mike Talkman, who was slowed down considerably. Yeah, it's time to see this lineup take another step. We need Seiya to be healthy. We need Seiya hitting like he was, maybe not at the extremely elite level, but looking like the guy who was in the second half last year and the start this year, this is probably just a stretch, as it is a small sample size alert. But... Enough lecturing. The Cubs take on the St. Louis Cardinals this weekend as part of our series preview. They have three games out of Bush, and they immediately follow that with a series with the Brew Crew up in Milwaukee. So a very solid stretch for the Cubs. We'll talk about the next series after that next week, which will be the Reds uh, in their first trip to Wrigley this year and the first time the Cubs seeing the Reds for a nice turning into June series as we close the book on May and try to decide what that means for this year's Cubs team. So one look at the hot stove standings before we move on. The Brew Crew, the Milwaukee Brewers, continue to be in first place in the NL Central. They have not necessarily pulled away. No one in this division has really pulled away. Um, but there are some teams that are beginning to lag behind 
Um, the Cubs are in second. They're only two games back with one game plus on that wild card with the extra wild card slots. They are 27 and 24 with the Brew Crew at 28 and 21. The St. Louis Cardinals, the Redbirds, are 23 and 26. They have gone eight and, out and two in their last 10. They've won three straight. Yes, they do have a minus 43 run differential. It will be interesting to see what the Cubs do. Bush Stadium at times has been a household horror for the Cubs. They have been a very successful franchise for a very long time. I don't think this is a walk in the park series for the Cubs ever, regardless of the roster. And I would think that the Cardinals fans would think the same thing of the Cubs as this is just a rivalry series and has been Joe Buck. Everybody, every Cub player, <laughs> every Cub fan's favorite announcer returns for the broadcast tomorrow on Fox. Um, it's his first return to baseball since he had shifted away from baseball on the football pro- as his primary broadcasting assignment. So it'll be his return to baseball, and every Cub fan in the world is so happy that he chose a Cubs Cardinals game to return to. Uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates are just behind the Cardinals at 23 and 28. Young team, Paul Scene's coming up, changes that rotation a little bit. And we have the Cincinnati Reds, who are 20 and 30. If you think the Cubs are having offensive troubles in May, my lord, like hug a Red fan, you know they are having more offensive troubles than we are in the month of may they are last in the circuit or first if you turn the list upside down which i'm sure that's not something that you're going to do but sometimes it makes me feel better they have a 67 weight of runs created plus they have been bit by the injury bug they've seen a lot of wrist injuries so hopefully moving forward they can get healthy if you're a reds fan but they are in last place in this division Before I move on to our next segment, which we do have a special guest, I do want to take a moment to thank Wrigleyville Sports. Wrigleyville Sports is a sponsor of Bricks Behind the Ivy. And as one, they have provided us a special discount code for all you brickheads out there. So take a look in this bio, take a look in the description of this podcast, click on the link to Wrigleyville Sports. Once you get there, find some stuff you want. Maybe you're looking for some Sky stuff. Maybe you're looking for some Cub stuff. I'm always looking for Cub stuff, like this hat or this Kerry Wood jersey. Like These are things that I constantly need in my life. And if you see this basement, there's more space to probably put some more Cub stuff in. And there's no better place to go than right by the ball field in Wrigley Field or on their website at Wrigley Field Sports. So get those things in your cart, get them ready to check out, and then use our special discount code BRICKS10 for 10% off of your order. Once again, that's BRICKS10. And thank you, Wrigley Field Sports, for being a sponsor. And you can't mention sponsors without mentioning... Wrigley Fire Bar and Grill, a new sponsor to the Bricks Behind the Ivy family, run by the great Pat Erickson, who is our access to the legendary Harry Carey. Check out Wrigley Fire Bar and Grill on Facebook, and thank you for being a sponsor. So today, I had the privilege of sitting down and talking with Alex Cohen, who is the play-by-play announcer for the Iowa Cubbies. If you were not aware of that, you've probably actually heard his voice before as he has done Cub games during the spring training. And there have been there's been way more coverage of the Cubs minor league teams on Marquee, which is kind of the beauty of Marquee. And to me, the intent of Marquee is to take your Cubs television station and provide as much Cubs coverage as possible. So the Road to Wrigley, which is a program on there, he gets to do with Elise Meneker and highlight different things that are going on in the Cubs minor league system. And of course, there are several Iowa Cub games that are broadcasted each year on Marquee. Alex and I sit down and talk about some things that are going on in Iowa, talk about our thoughts on the 2024 Cubs thus far, and a few other nuggets about how he got into broadcasting and what team got him into baseball. And guess what? It wasn't the Cubs. So let's check this conversation out. Cup fans, thanks again for sticking around. Today we have Alex Cohen, the play-by-play announcer for our beloved Iowa Cubbies out there in Des Moines. Thank you so much for joining us today on Bricks Behind the Ivy. Really appreciate you guys having me. Um, thanks for for having me on. I'm looking forward to talking some some Iowa Cubs and some Chicago Cubs with you guys too. So. 
yeah, it's been it's been nice to I think as a Cub fan base, and I want to say since Theo Epstein, there's been just a renewed focus on the minor league system for the Cubs. And I'm assuming then you guys have seen just kind of different type of fan attendance as certain players have made their ways through the system. As I think Cub fans not only became obsessed with the major league team, they became obsessed with what's happening next, which is such a cool thing for someone myself who loves baseball. What's happening next has always been the thing that I focus my energy on. So now having this renewed focus on just, I would say, one of the the better farm systems now in baseball, a lot of pundits would say as well, there's been probably just an increase in attention that you guys are getting at this point. Yeah, definitely, especially with our games being on Marquee Sports Network and, you know, going from, I'm not going to say a bottom tier farm system, but like middle of the pack. And then when you, you know, trade Chris Bryan and you trade Javier Baez and you trade uh, Anthony Rizzo, you get that influx of talent. And then when you draft well, when you hit on your first round draft picks, like the Cubs did with Nico Horner and what they did with Jordan Wicks and what they hopefully did with Kate Horton and Matt Shaw. I mean, that completely revitalizes your farm system. So um, now you're a top five farm system in all of baseball, and there, there's a lot of attention being put on the Iowa Cubs and really on the Tennessee Smokies and the Myrtle Beach Pelicans and the South Bend Cubs, and it's good for the organization. Absolutely. I think that it also helps grow the game and being in these different markets across the United States. The Cubs have always been this national brand from the WGN years, but as things have shifted the marquee to a more singular focus, singular, singular television network that has, you know, some regional access issues as they address some of the blackout areas and such that the things that are beyond their control, it is good that, you know, towns like Myrtle Beach and Tennessee, where the Tennessee Smokies are and Des Moines are getting some additional attention and growing the fan base of the Chicago Cubs outside the Chicago area. So Alex, um, the first question I want to ask you today, I think is a very simple question. One thing that we like to focus on here is kind of your baseball or your Cubs story, like where, where things came from, what, what got you into baseball and was it specifically the Cubs? Uh, So I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Uh, So I grew up a Philly fan. Um, so listening to Harry Callis and going to games at Veterans Stadium and going to the the first game at Citizens Bank Ballpark. But but I did start getting into the Cubs in college. So I went to Indiana University uh, okay. in Bloomington, Indiana, and all of my friends, dorm, fraternity, like all of my close friends were Chicago Cubs fans. And naturally, being the antagonist I was at that age, you know, I wanted to hate the Cubs so badly. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know what? Don't, don't knock it until you try it. Come visit us, you know, during the summer. We'll take you to a Cubs game. We'll sit in the bleachers, and you'll never look back. And I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. So summer <laughs> after my freshman year, I went to Chicago for a weekend to visit my friends, and we were only supposed to go to one game. It was the, the Friday game. It was an afternoon game. It was Cubs-Marlins sitting in the bleachers, and we went to all three games that weekend. I just I fell in love with the atmosphere, going out in Wrigleyville, um, just being there, singing Go Cubs Go. It's just – it's exactly what baseball is supposed to be like. So I think, you know, I started becoming more of a Cubs fan and appreciating the Cubs brand when I went to college. And granted, that was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So um, that is now, you know, materialized into me working for the AAA affiliate for the Cubs – and really appreciate what they're doing and getting to know the fan base. Yeah, I can I can relate at being antagonistic at that age. I, I grew up in the South Side, for those who have not realized that on this podcast, I'm from the South Side of Chicago. So this basement is almost a shrine against everyone that lives in my area. Uh, they all grew up <laughs> White Sox yeah. fans. And um, I think that made me a very like studied and defensive Cubs fan, which probably helped me become more analytical in the game. But it wasn't for the best of reasons. It was more of just winning arguments amongst everyone else who wanted me to go to the yeah. games. <laughs> no, it's, uh, that's, it's, it's, that's 100% how I felt when I went to college. Um, and I never really got on like the Bears fandom, but you know, the Cubs fandom was easy to to get once you go to Wrigley Field and once you sit in the bleachers and you go on a summer day and it's just, it's baseball perfection. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know I'm also very biased on that, but yeah, one the only baseball park left, yes, not the original turf, but that Jackie Robinson has played at. So it's just a really cool tie to the history of the game and the feel, the look, even as they modernize the ballpark. They've done a really mm-hmm. good job of retaining the things that make Wrigley so special while 
moving it into the future with video boards and things like that. So I do appreciate the the amount of time they they took to get that the 1060 project right. So that being said, uh, did you have a favorite baseball player growing up on the Phillies? Um, so I grew up. So I was really during my high school days is when they started getting good again. Um, so, I mean, I remember going to the first game at Citizens Bank Ballpark and seeing, you know, it was uh, Billy Wagner throwing 100 miles an hour. And I'm like, man, that's absolute smoke. And then, you know, when I was older in high school, 2007, they were back seven and a half games, 17 to play against the Mets, came back and won the division. So that era of Phillies baseball, Ryan Howard, Chase Utley, Jimmy Rollins, Cole Hamels were among my favorite players. And it was pretty cool when Cole Hamels then – yeah, you know, became a Chicago Cub and then rehab with the Iowa Cubs. Uh, that that was a pretty cool mixing of the worlds. Uh, my favorite non uh, non Phillies baseball player was Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, just because I thought that you know I was a center fielder growing up and I wanted to be Ken the right handed version of Ken Griffey Jr. And my favorite hitter far and away was Sammy Sosa. Uh, just uh, Sammy the Sammy Shuffle. You know, sixty home runs in five years and. Um, he was just a special hitter. So, like, the wiffle ball stance as a right-handed hitter, um, it was definitely like Sammy hitting bombs and, like, me shuffling around my backyard. I think it adds. it's hard to grow up in the Chicago area and being of the appropriate age in 1998 and not have your batting stance be Sammy Sosa's. He was Correct. just such a huge influence on the Cub fandom that probably exists today, which – not to go down this rabbit hole of the Cubs Hall of Fame. I, I think things need to be made right. I think he needs to be part of the history of this team to yeah. in almost as much as there is a conversation about how he did what he did, but what he did for this organization and what he did for baseball and grabbing the attention back after the strike, just it's too monumental to ignore. I have a whole section of the Candid Cub Cave that is just Sammy Sosa memorabilia, which is why this space exists. I had boxes of it when I was a kid, and I was like, someday I'm going to have my own house, and there's going to be the Sammy Sosa shrine, and I'm going to be so yeah. happy. It wasn't about the wife and the kids. It was about a it's section of my Sammy house. Sosa. It was Sammy <laughs> Sosa <laughs> Uh, it's funny, actually, now with the Cubs transitioning, and we'll, we'll transition softly into talking about the Major League squad. Uh, my batting stance for a number of years was um, in McDuff for Craig Council. Um, being a Cubs fan growing up, there weren't many playoff teams to watch. So when it got to be September, you started picking new favorite teams so that you could ride them into the end of baseball season. And for me, when Mark Grace went to the Arizona Diamondbacks, it was that 2001 Diamondbacks team, which, I mean, is second to the 2016 World Series is the greatest World Series that I've watched in my lifetime, just how that one ended. And but I started batting like Craig Council because he was on that team, which if anyone remembers, and we'll throw a picture up on the, the video pod, what he used to bat like, I looked pretty ridiculous for an alarming amount of time. And I have I have friends that will tell you that is exactly how I batted till I was about 14. So <laughs> um, that being said, um, well, how do you think, what are your thoughts on this year's Major League Club as we reach, uh, you know, well over the quarter mark of the season as we head into, I would say, the potential trade discussion, roster supplementation part of the season, yeah. thinking how things can improve. What do you think they're doing well? You what know, do you think they're not doing well? You know, you look at the season right now, what, they're four games over 500. And if you would have asked me in February, you know, the Chicago Cubs are going to deal with injuries to say a Suzuki, Cody Bellinger, Dansby Swanson, Nico Horner for a short period of time, not get any offensive production from your catchers to this point. Um, and then on the pitching side, have Justin Steele be out for six weeks, have Jamison Tyone being out for four weeks, um, and having, what, 50% of your bullpen down with injuries and still be four games over 500. sign me up. I, uh -huh. I, would take to, I would take that to the bank. I would take that to Vegas. So I, I think all things considered – They've done a tremendous job navigating injuries and dealing with a new manager and a new staff and getting to know the players. And I think Craig Council's done a tremendous job. I really do. I think being four games over 500 at this juncture with all of those injuries and all of those moving parts, it's a luxury at this point. 
Yeah, I think that sometimes gets lost in, I would say, the, the Twitter vacuum that exists out there. If you interact with some of these Cubs communities, is there's always a discussion of this is not going well and the bullpen is bad and the offense is terrible. But yeah, if you take a step back, exactly what you said, there has been just an egregious amount of hardship. This has been a mash unit that has put together wins on early in the season, you know, people like MLB.com and Bleacher Nation and other Cubs sources have talked about this being the tougher part of the Cubs schedule. They have yeah. they have thrived in a situation that a lot of other teams I don't think would have thrived, which has been just a testament to the depth that they discussed this offseason, especially in that rotation and the next man up. And some of these guys you saw very early or for very little amounts of time in in Iowa. <laughs> so, yeah, I think Craig Council has done a tremendous job managing this group and having them being, you know, right in the thick of things. Why, as we head into the part of the summer where you start thinking, hey, how can we address this roster? How can we move this roster into the second half? and make sure that this is the group we want as we chase a playoff berth, which obviously is a few more spots than there has been historically for the playoffs. But yeah. look at the Diamondbacks last year. All you have to do is get in and play the right way, and we're having a completely different conversation of what this season means. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking Absolutely. forward to how that moves forward. So let's uh, let's refocus on the Iowa Cubs. What are sure. some things – what's going on with the Iowa Cubs – um, let's like check in on what their record is and players that yep. are currently standing out uh, for the team out in Des Moines. Yeah, currently 21 and 25. Um, I think as the big league team is starting to get healthy, uh, activating Dansby Swanson from the injury list, Nico Horner back in the lineup. Uh, some of the reinforcements from the big leagues are coming down, trickling down back to Iowa, which makes the Iowa Cubs offense a little bit better, getting Alexander Canario back, getting Pete Crow Armstrong back, uh, Matt Mervis back in the lineup as of two and a half weeks ago. So, you know, as the big league club gets healthier, we get better here in Iowa. So it's uh, I, I think the offense is really starting to swing the bat well. They scored you know, eight runs and an eight to seven win yesterday. They scored six runs and an 18 to six loss on Tuesday. You know, getting Pete Crow Armstrong back after some sustained success up in the big league has been big. He homered in his second at bat. Um, and then yesterday he had two singles and walked twice. So, I mean, he is the, the straw that stirs the drink for this offense. If he's swinging well, they're going to play well. Um, and then just having Matt Mervis here, obviously, he's had a lot of success at the AAA level and just a lot of talent. B.J. Murray really starting to heat up. Owen Casey's been great all year. Um, and then Brendan Davis, you know, sh shades of 2021, you know, hitting over 400 in his last 11 games with seven home runs. So, I mean, those are five guys right there in the lineup that are really talented, still really young. And you combine that with the David Bodies of the world, guys who have five years of big league experience come down here and they can show su sustained success. And, you know, David's homer in back-to-back -back games. So we just talked about six players at six out of the nine spots in the lineup right there that you would view as pluses. So I think the offense is in a really good shape. Yeah, I think it's very interesting to think about if you're living in Des Moines and going to an Iowa Cubs game, like my immediate reaction as a fan would be, I want that team to win because this is the team that's here. But thinking about AAA baseball is like the best players, you really want them to not be there anymore. You want them to move up to the major league squad. So it has to be yeah. a weird juxtaposition. How, how would you describe like the fan base at an, at an Iowa or at an Iowa Cubs game? Are they, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're cognitively aware of that situation, but I'm also, yeah, I'm sure people yeah. come there to see the team win or are they coming there to see specific players or is there kind of a mix of both? It's a mix of both. And when you're an organization that's been you know, linked with the Chicago Cubs for over three decades, you don't really see that many long tenured minor league, major league affiliate relationships like that. So, you know, we've been here at Principal Park AAA baseball for over 50 years. And, you know, being with the Cubs for three decades, there's a lot of Cubs fans here. And they like all the players. They like the major league rehabbers that come down. They like the 4A players that have spent time up in the big leagues. They love the prospects. They love the guys who, you know, the Cubs signed to a minor league deal, the Dan Straley's and the Julio Tehran's and the Kirk Casale's of the world. Um, I think it's all-encompassing for these Iowa Cubs slash Chicago Cubs fans, and it makes it one of the best environments in all of minor league baseball. 
Agreed. I think I have yet to be to an Iowa Cubs game. It's on my bucket list of things I need to do. I've I've done Myrtle Beach, um, which is, I guess, kind of random. And I have a lot of family that's in South Bend. So I've done the South Bend Cubs since um, I used to go to the games when they were the South Bend Silverhawks and unaffiliated. Yes. And I remember how big of a deal it was when the Cubs signed um, with South Bend to build that performance facility in the conversations around, well, we'll send players to rehab given proximity and the Cubs having yeah. like the luxury of two options of Des Moines and South Bend being so relatively close to send major league players to do their rehab. It's been so good for the city of South Bend, just as the Iowa Cubs have been so good to Des Moines. So I do want to yeah. kind of... Slide back a little bit. Um, so sure. you're the play-by-play -play announcer. You're the Pat Hughes of <laughs> the Iowa Cubs for folks. Yeah. How did you get into sure. broadcasting, and uh, what led you to the Iowa Cubs? Yeah, so in high school, uh, my friends and I actually started the sports broadcasting club, uh, Upper Dublin High oh, School, wow. just outside of Philadelphia. So this has been you know, a career in the making for the last two decades. It's something that I've known that I've wanted to do ever since I realized that I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player. And that's when you realize <laughs> that power flat fastballs don't play in the big leagues. So uh, being able to start the sports broadcasting club with my friends, uh, broadcasted everything. Uh, I think our second broadcast was powder puff football. So doing a powder puff football game, uh, hockey, lacrosse, basketball, volleyball, swimming, golf. And the only sport that I didn't broadcast in high school was baseball because I played. Uh, but I knew I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player. Went to Indiana University, um, went to the journalism school, wanted to more be like a writer and a talk show host personality. Did student radio for four years there. And that's when I did a lot more play-by-play -play and realized like I have a lot more passion when it comes to play-by-play -play than sports talk radio. Want to continue that. Um, so my first internship in minor league baseball was 2009 with the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs just okay. outside of Philadelphia. So 2009, 2010 with them. 2011, worked as the number two broadcaster for the Gateway Grizzlies, Independent Ball, Frontier League, just outside of St. Louis. Um, and then started the minor league trek two years with the Huntsville Stars, double-A affiliate of the Milwaukee Brewers. Spent one year out of broadcasting in the media relations realm uh, with the Oakland Athletics in Oakland, California. Then I realized I missed having a mic in front of my face, and I talk way too much, and I'm way too obnoxious to be behind the scenes. So <laughs> kind of started from there. Went to Australia, called games in the Australian Baseball League for summer out there, winter here. Oh, wow. uh, that was the winter of 2014. Uh, then came back and uh, was the broadcaster for the Idaho Falls Chuckers, rookie league affiliate for the Kansas City Royals in 2015. 2016, uh, voice of the Bowling Green Hot Rod, single-A affiliate of the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, and then 2018 to now, voice of the Iowa Cubs. So it's been uh, a roundabout journey, nonlinear path with uh, a lot of states and a lot of time zones. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a bunch of names that I recognize, and I'm sure a lot of folks recognize. I know this past uh, spring training, and I believe this spring training before, you got the opportunity to do some of the spring training games on Marquee. Yeah. Um, can you tell us uh, just kind of how surreal that was to be part of the Marquee brand and the incorporation of the Marquee brand and being able to announce some of the major league players, any cool interactions you've had with, you know, JD and Boog and, you know, some of the other household names of the Cubs? Yeah, you know, first I'll start backwards with that. Uh, Boog and JD are tremendous broadcasters and they are tremendous yes. people they are everything about them that you see on the television they're back and forth and how genuinely excited they are about the game and about working with each other it's it's not a facade it's not fake it's all real um they are so genuine they're excitable they're you know conscious of the fans and what they want to hear and what they're looking to hear um in regards to a two and a half three hour broadcast um, they are very, very respectful. Um, and I'm just a triple A broadcaster and they, you know, we, we talk a lot just about players that are coming up. They talk to me about players that are coming down, how they've done. I talk about players, how you know, they've done here when they come back up. So we have a, a really you know, harmonious relationship. Uh, Pat Hughes is a hall of fame broadcaster. He is a hall of fame person. He is the sweetest man on the face of the earth. Um, and he is a voice and tones that are synonymous with Chicago Cubs baseball and baseball in general. You are not going to get um, not only a better broadcaster than Pat Hughes, uh, but a better broadcast team on the radio than Pat Hughes and Ron, and Ron Coomer. Um, they are tremendous, and you could tell how much they like working with each other and the rapport that they built together. 
uh, broadcasting, you know, spring training games. I've done a couple on the score, uh, two. I've done a couple on marquee, nine of them. And uh, it's among the base, best baseball moments of my career. You know, being able to go to a packed Sloan Park, uh, 15,000, 16,000 fans, Cubs win, everybody's happy. You play Go, go Cubs Go. You close your eyes, you listen, and the hair sticks up on your arm. It's just, it's such a special atmosphere. I mean, I can't even imagine what it'd be like calling a game at Wrigley Field with 40,000 fans saying Cubs go, yeah. Cubs go. So, um, but being able to do that the last two spring trainings, it's, if not the biggest moment of my baseball career, among the biggest moments in my baseball broadcasting career. I think it's really cool to hear as a fan who feels like those exact feelings, those goosebumps in those moments that like the broadcasting team, like the, just how genuine of people they are also feels those things. Like, I think that's one thing maybe some Cub fans take for granted. Just those like moments that Wrigley don't happen other places, like the way yeah. the broadcasting teams that we have aren't as great in other places. <laughs> I don't think they understand from top to bottom, just how, I mean, How yeah, good have it. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, can't, I can't speak for all Cubs fans, but yeah, I listen and I watch a lot of baseball and I don't think there's any broadcast team better uh, than the Cubs TV and radio broadcast teams. Uh, I think Boog is on the Mount Rushmore of TV broadcasters and he ate number four and Pat Hughes is a <laughs> Hall of Famer and, and he might be the Pat Hughes might be the best radio broadcaster in baseball. So to have those two at your disposal for 162 games or television-wise, 150, 148 games, it's a special combination, and, and Cubs fans should be lucky to be able to listen to them, watch them, and hear them over the course of a season. Yeah, for me, people like that feel like borderline family because of how often their voices are in my home. That is, and yep. that is a feeling that you might not get from other announcers. And even for those who are into like sports video games, like Luke Shiambi is the voice of MLB the show as well. It's just there is so much like so, something very special to like as a Cub fan to be able to claim like that's the guy I get to hear every day on TV. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. He's not Roy Kent from Ted Lasso, but he is. <laughs> he's very well. He's very well <laughs> exposed. I'm have to tell him that. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, you know, and that was ad libbed. I didn't even write that down, so we're <laughs> wish no one's gonna buy in real time. But um, the last question I'll ask you today before I let you go, and I really appreciate you taking some time uh, with us. I think there's a lot of sure. names, especially um, at Des Moines, um, which the S is silent, as Ron Coomer tells me in those plugs on 670 all the time, that the yeah. Cub fans are very dialed into. Is there a name that you're watching right now that is going to sneak onto this Cubs roster? And like, I, I would probably think maybe the bullpen or something that no one is really talking about as much as some of the bats that you think, hey, guys, circle this name. I think they're going to be a very productive and be player for this team maybe this year or next year. Yeah, um, I'll start with the bullpen. Uh, Sam McWilliams is an arm who's really intriguing. Uh, Sam was, you know, in AAA with a couple different organizations, then out of baseball for a year, and then back. And he's a six-seven righty with three good pitches and a fastball that runs ninety-six to ninety-eight, and striking out about seventeen batters per nine innings. And other you know, stuff that he needs to work on here. He's a little susceptible to the long ball and and holding on runners and just being a little bit quicker to the plate, but. In terms of pure stuff, uh, he's probably a back end of the bullpen caliber arm type of type of pitcher, um, and I think that if he's able to get the ball down in the zone a little bit more, um, it controls not an issue as it was earlier in his career. The strikeout numbers are really high. Everything sharp, curveball, slider, fastball. I mean it. It jumps out of his arm. It's a big league sound to it. So I think Sam McWilliams is one guy that sticks out to me. And then offensively, I don't think people are talking enough about Owen Casey and B.J. Murray Jr. I mean, I know Owen Casey's the, what, second or third-ranked prospect in the Cubs organization, but he literally can do everything. Um, he <laughs> is one of the more athletic outfielders that I've seen. And granted, I mean, I've been able to see Pete Crow Armstrong the last two years, and I think Pete could beat Owen Casey in a 40-yard dash and a 60-yard dash. If we're talking about 100 meters, I think Owen might beat Pete which is crazy to think. I mean, oh, Owen wow. has 
some incredible speed. It's a plus tool for him. Um, he's gotten a lot better defensively. He's gotten above average arm. Um, and the plate discipline is so advanced for his age. He's 21 years old. He's top 10 in the league in on-base percentage. He's top five in the league in walks. He's on pace for 100 walks this year. Um, and oh, wow. a guy who's on, also on pace for 35 doubles, du double-digit home runs. And I think the power will continue to materialize as the weather gets warmer, summer gets hotter. Um, you could be looking at a a 40 double 100 walk 20 home run season for my one Casey at age 21 at the triple a level. That's pretty darn special. So um, I think that people know that Owen Casey's good. Um, I don't think that they talk about him enough in like the upper elk of Cubs prospects. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a name that even on the Twitter verse that gets thrown in a lot in hypothetical trade situations. And to me, watching him this spring, looking at the numbers, the age, like he's become untouchable in my mind because I, I think some of the things he's doing are completely different types of skills that I would love to add to this major league roster at a corner of the outfield spot. And I know when the Cubs acquired him, which I believe was in the, he was one of the pieces in the, Devar the U Darvish trade, um, yep. which like at the time, like a lot of fans grumbled about in its salary movement. But, you know, you get a lot of those very young prospects. You don't really know what you're getting, but they're major league prospects because of their potential upside. So those are lottery tickets. And this one might be yeah. one of those that like we're one scratch off away from, you know, being millionaires. Uh, <laughs> no one Casey, he looks, he looks the part in the, yeah, the defense is the one thing I've seen that has really, really improved because I think there was some discussion last year of like, well, maybe he could be the first baseman. And now there's no discussion about moving him from the outfield. And I believe he played center field the other night, too, which is. He did. Yeah, he, had, he had two games in center field. When we were playing in Syracuse. Um, it, it's really interesting. You said that one of your player, favorite players was Mark Grace. Um, and yes. Once he went over to the Diamondbacks. Um, I, I was talking to a scout last week. And I asked him, like, what are your comps for Owen Casey? And he said two names. Mark Grace was one of them, and Sean Casey was the other one. And those are guys who have made a lot of all-star teams, and they have a lot of time up in the big leagues, and they help revitalize uh, their respective franchises. So I think when you're compared to those two guys offensively and you have a bevy of athleticism where you can play both corner outfield positions and even move to first, there's a lot to be excited about talking about Owen Casey. Absolutely. And then politically, he's already the mayor of Cincinnati in that comp. And he has the most hits of any player in the 90s. So that's pretty impressive for a guy born in the 2000s. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Travels uh, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Alex. If you want to do just a little plug of where folks can find you and maybe the next few broadcasts on Marquee so they can tune in and see the Iowa Cubs and some of these players you're talking about. Yeah, uh, so my social media handles at Voice of Cohen Two on Twitter. Um, also, be sure to check out at Iowa Cubs on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and all your other social media channels. Twitter as well, or I guess X at this point. But um, yeah. we try to keep you up to date with as much social media content as possible. Uh, so we just had our last broadcast on Marquee yesterday. Kate Horton on the mound. Horton you know, pitched really well, five innings, two runs, struck out six. Um, our next broadcast on Marquee Sports Network, I believe, is the first week of June. Um, so we have this series right now. We go to Louisville for a six-game series, and then we come back for a six-game series. So I believe it's that Wednesday. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we have 18 games on Marquee Sports Network this year. I think 13 of those remaining. We already had five. Um, and then you'll be able to see us on Road to Wrigley Live on Marquee Sports Network too. So be able to catch a lot of the Iowa Cubs. And you know, right now the Iowa Cubs with Pete Crow Armstrong, Alexander Canario, Owen Casey, BJ Murray Jr., Cade Horton. It's a lot of prospects. And, and waiting in the wings, you have the James Triantoses, the Matt Shaws, and the Kevin Alcantara. So um, it's a fun time to be a Cubs fan at the upper levels of the minor leagues because you have such an influx of talent. Absolutely. And it is definitely a time to pick yourself up if you're in the Chicago area take advantage of this warm weather that's coming and drive out to Des Moines and check out our Iowa Cubbies, maybe get some some autographs. I know that they have a Marvel theme night and some Marvel memorabilia for you um, comic book nerds, much like myself, that has that cool crossover of two things you might love. So yeah, make the trip. I've heard it's worth it. I plan on making a trip with my family in the near future. But Thanks, everyone, again for listening. Thanks, Alex, for hopping on. This has been another episode of Brooks Behind the Ivy, a Cubs podcast for Cub fans by Cub fans. We'll see you guys next week.
want to support Bricks Behind the Ivy, check out the Bricks Behind the Ivy swag store. There's a link in our bio for the store. Check out the items. There are tank tops, t-shirts, three-quarter zips, notebooks, bumper stickers, stickers for your laptop, anything you can imagine. It's there with your BBTI logo. So come on, Brickheads, our official name for our official fans. Check out this fan swag store today and pick up some items this Memorial Day weekend or think of Dad. Father's Day is coming soon. Check it out today. Holy cow!